Fifty years ago, this man was the most wanted person in the British Empire. He has more than 30 aliases, but he is most commonly known as Chin Peng. All next train for a glimpse of the number one terrorist. There he is, that's him. Chin Peng, directly responsible for a brutal seven-year campaign of murder and terrorism against the ordinary people of Malaya. Earlier, he had been awarded the OBE for helping the British fight the Japanese in World War II. We are gathered together here today to honor the leaders who symbolize the magnificent struggle which the people of all communities in Malaya put up during the war. This film is the story of how one of Britain's most dependable wartime allies became one of her gravest post-war enemies. For 12 years, the British battled to crush Chin Peng's communists. They put in place a level of population control rarely seen before or since. Though a war by any other name, it was known throughout as the Malayan Emergency. A fictional Chin Peng has appeared in several films and novels. The man behind these new outbreaks is Ah Siong, late of the Chinese 136 group, trained by us to fight the Japs. <laughs> and believe it or not, he marched beside us in the victory parade. I'm Ah Siang. His fictional counterpart you know usually comes to a sticky him. end. But since the real Chin Peng came into the open in 1989, he has not given a full account of his career. Now, in his first major interview, he speaks for the first time about his role in the emergency. Do you now regret starting the war? I never regret. Because it was not we, CPM, who started the war. It was the British government who fired the first shot. And we return, or we retaliate with the second shot. So the British government and its colonial, its colonial policy should be responsible for all this. It's turning language upside down. I, he provoked the emergency by starting off by murdering a few rubber planters and other people. Uh, in eastern Malaya. It was they who were out to take over the country. We want to make some improvement. They want to drag back to what was in 1941, before the Japanese invasion. And he's talking absolute rubbish, quite frankly. I mean, British policy post-war was eventual independence. I don't think any time factor was involved in the early days, anyhow. So I don't see how he can think that at all. Before the war, Malaya was one of Britain's richest colonies. In 120 years, the British had developed two enormous industries rubber and tin. Both relied heavily on imported labor from China and India. By the 1930s, there were as many Chinese in British Malaya as there were Malays. But British rule was to end suddenly. In 54 days, the Japanese overran the country. In 54 days, they undid the work of more than a century. In 1942, the Japanese drove the British out of Malaya 
and the rest of Southeast Asia in humiliation. In Malaya, resistance to Japanese rule was spearheaded by the Communist Party. The Communists were used to working in secret. Before the war, they'd been banned by the British for demanding independence. But now both sides had a common interest, the defeat of Japan. The Communists organized a guerrilla army that grew to a strength of 10,000. The three stars on their caps stood for the three major races of Malaya. But the army was always predominantly Chinese. Their bases were deep in the jungle that covers most of the Malay Peninsula. And it was here that the British sent a team of officers to make contact with them. In December 1943, the two sides met to negotiate an alliance. The communists were represented by their secretary general, a shadowy figure by the name of Lai Tech. Lai Tech was accompanied by his right-hand man, 19-year-old Chin Peng. They agreed to cooperate with the British, even though their stated aim was an independent communist republic of Malaya after the war. But despite this agreement, Lai Tech set up another army. This army was to be kept secret from the British. In order to convince our people, we still have an army under our command. So he devised this secret army. And we readily accepted it. It seemed a good, clever policy. The plan was that after the defeat of Japan, the secret army would try to take control of as much of Malaya as the British would allow. We didn't ask the question, but at our heart, I think we have to, uh, Eventually, we will have to fight with these forces. They will not let us occupy the town. The British dropped thousands of weapons and ammunition supplies to the guerrillas. The best of these were diverted straight to the secret army and they were never used to fight the Japanese. After the Japanese surrender, communist commanders issued instructions to their secret units to take control of the towns before the British returned. But within days, Lai Tech changed the plan. He ordered the secret army to be dissolved and their weapons buried in the jungle. The open army now cooperated fully with the victorious British. Chin Peng was among those decorated. Two months later, Lai Tech agreed to disband the rest of the anti-Japanese army, much to the dismay of the troops. We so why did Lai Tech abandon the plan to seize power in 1945? He told party members he did not believe the time was right. But the real reason may have had more to do with Lai Tech's secret past. Someone from Special Branch brought Lai Tech to Singapore. And from that point onwards, he had accelerated promotion within the party because Special Branch would conveniently knock off the next people above him, so that in a very short time he became Secretary General of the Malayan Communist Party. When the Japanese invaded, Lai Tech switched sides and became their agent. But what he did after the British returned is less clear, since the official files are still kept secret. One of the few historians to have had privileged access is Anthony Short. Do you believe he was controlled by Special Branch at this point? Um, I think the inference is that he was. So could that have influenced Communist Party policy? 
Yes, I think so. Um, there were quite a number of people in the party who wanted to resist the British return because this was, a, as the Vietnamese put it, a moment of great opportunity. Um, and I think the fact that Lai Tuck is in position uh, with his reputation undiminished under the Japanese occupation, um, I think this probably had a major influence on the, po on the party's decision to cooperate with the British rather than to oppose them. In 1947, Chin Peng was instrumental in exposing his former boss as a traitor to the party and later succeeded him as Secretary General. As for Lai Tech, he disappeared before he could be confronted, taking with him most of the party's funds. He was never seen again, but the rumor is that he was tracked down and eliminated in Bangkok. Did you have him killed? Yes, he was liquidated in Bangkok by some people and not me, not our party, by some other people. But on your orders? Pardon? But on your orders? No. We came to know our day after that. We will never know whether the rising that Lytek stopped in 1945 would have brought the communists success. But there is no doubt the next three years would see their advantage slip away from them. The post-war priority for the returning British was to restore the economy to pre-war levels. It had been virtually ruined. I mean, the, the basic prosperity of the Malay Peninsula was based on rubber and tin. During the Japanese occupation, those industries more or less came to a halt. Within two years, rubber and tin production were in full flow again. Malaya was now earning twice as many American dollars as the rest of Britain's colonies put together. The Malayan communists were by far the biggest political force in the country. But having disbanded their army, they were now campaigning legally for self-government. We thought we can force the British to make some concession. Yeah, especially when the British Labour government is in power. We thought of that. You can say we have some illusion. The communists now concentrated on organizing trade unions throughout the country. Although production was higher than ever, wages were lower in real terms than in the 1930s. These conditions played into the communists' hands. There was a young trade union movement that had built up. They were very inexperienced and they were targets for communist penetration. And the communists did penetrate the trade unions. And there was a lot of unrest on the two prime economic products of the country, rubber and tin. So it wasn't a happy situation. During 1947, there were over 300 strikes called throughout Malaya. The reaction of the authorities was at times severe. Wouldn't you say the shooting of strikers was a response to increasingly aggressive organising of strikes by the communist trade unions? Perhaps so, but from our side, we consider the post-war period, we must have some more freedom, at least comparable to what? the workers and peoples enjoy in Western Europe or in Britain. But we are denied that. As industrial unrest continued to critical levels, the communists moved towards a policy of armed violence. Exactly how they did this has been a mystery for 50 years. But according to Chin Peng, it began here in Kuala Lumpur with a meeting of the party's most secret organ, the Politburo, in late January 1948. Someone raised the question whether it is correct or not to pursue the peaceful tactic 
struggle. Since that, after Chavala surrender nearly three years, we gain nothing. At the same time, at a rather different meeting on the other side of Kuala Lumpur, the British inaugurated a new constitution, the Federation of Malaya. We heard the booming of the artillery. That one who proposed it, uh, who, who raised the question, is you see, what happened now? The communists saw nothing for them in the new constitution, since it made no mention of independence. Furthermore, the constitution left over a million Malayan Chinese without rights of citizenship. It favoured Malays enormously. They were very conscious of uh, the Chinese economic prosperity might be turned into political domination. And therefore, the constitution does have quite a number of provisions which preserve the position of the Malays. In March, the Communist Central Committee met in Singapore and reached a fateful decision. According to Chin Peng, the committee believed the British were planning to ban all communist trade unions. We consider that a very serious step. Step by step, we will be driven out of the trade union and out of the political arena. Perhaps one day we will be banned. So that means we have to launch, to, to make some preparation uh, to launch armed struggle, if that happens. Yeah. Some weeks later, the bill banning their trade unions was drafted by government officials. You must appreciate that this is very much an international issue. The Soviet Union were turning the heat on in the Far East. Communist parties in Burma, Malaya, Mao Zedong was advancing in China, taking over China, the Philippines, Indonesia. All the communist parties there were causing unrest and trouble. So, I mean, Malaya wasn't any different from that. But it wasn't just a local, local war, but it was fairly Soviet policy, basically. Did you receive any instructions from outside Malaya to launch this revolt? No. Did you receive any instructions from the Chinese Communist Party to revolt? No. What I say is that we didn't receive any order from either Moscow or Peking. But before they could start a guerrilla war, they first ordered their trade unions to adopt extreme measures. From April 1948, it was policy to kill those who opposed their strikes. Why was it OK to kill people in strikes? Because there were some, usually there were some strike breakers. Try to sabotage the strike. So, how to deal with that? Yeah. So, so that uh, if necessary, we can beat them. Probably we dare not beat them, you see. Or, kill them as a warning to other strike breakers. Actually, a uh, majority of workers were, were happy about that. They didn't say no. If workers said no, we dare not do that. They may have been too frightened to say no. I don't think so. By June, some sections of the British community wanted the government to go on the offensive. We and the police were trying to get the MCP, the Malayan Communist Party, banned. We knew who they were. 
We knew a lot about them as a result, of course, of the war years. But the government wouldn't take any action. By now, communists were slipping away secretly into the jungle. But the communist leadership believed they had some months yet to prepare for the coming conflict. We think British will launch a full scale attack the earliest in September. Perhaps the earliest, perhaps a bit late, perhaps much later. So before September, we have to get our nuclear force laid ready in every state. The timetable changed abruptly when armed communist guerrillas shot dead three British planters here at Songhai Seaput. My own reaction to it was then, this is something very serious. These armed terrorists had been marching down towards Sungi Seaput in the first estate they come to. Spence, the manager, was not at home. We carried on and again, the manager was fortunate in not being around at the time. So the first estate, they found the manager, Wally Walker, sitting in his office and they shot him from his office chair. We consider the European planters as a symbol of colonial rule. In general, they were hated by the workers. So, if they, if they want, they can kill it according to our policy, not against our policy. However, the local communist commander at Songhai Seaput claims the killing was not authorized. He says the planters had used police to disperse a recent strike. Some workers had been beaten and they called in a local communist killer squad to get revenge. Two days later, the government declared a nationwide state of emergency. Here was the all-out assault Chin Peng feared most, and three months earlier than he had expected. But shouldn't he have controlled his forces more tightly? If our policy laid down certain things that you cannot do, you cannot do, and that's forbidden, that would not be happened. Why didn't you lay that down? You can say we are inexperienced. Do you regret killing British planters now? I can say is that I'm sorry for those who were innocent. They have done nothing wrong. They have not suppress the people or the workers. Under the new emergency powers, the British could arrest anyone they liked. They started immediately with dawn and dusk raids on the homes of political activists. Many were Malays, like Rashid Maidin. The political life of the Malayan people, especially the Malays, they rise up. At that time, so the British uh, they consider this is very dangerous. So start the emergency law. British intelligence documents on the eve of the emergency stress the danger of Malays joining the revolt. The arrest of more than a thousand Malays did much to forestall that. If they were not arrested, they started their uh, struggle and joined hand with us. I think that would be a very powerful struggle. What, of course, helped us enormously was the fact that uh, Chin Peng's organization could never rid itself of, its, of being a Chinese image and not pan-racial. 
As the war got off to an uncertain start, both sides were guilty of reckless optimism. One British general claimed the job of beating the bandits, as they were termed in the early days, was the easiest task I've ever tackled. But there were others more cautious. Well, I took it seriously because I knew who they were. They weren't just rubber tappers, they were trained in guerrilla warfare. And one had to realize that one was going to be up against a first-class guerrilla-type enemy. On the communist side also, there were some who were overconfident. <laughs> In withdrawing to the countryside, the communists were looking to rely on the support of around half a million people who were eking out an existence on the fringes of the jungle. They were known as the squatters. These people were mostly Chinese, but not all, uh, who had fled from the urban areas during the Japanese occupation. And uh, there was no control in those areas by any civil authority, including the police. They were therefore the obvious target for the Malayan Communist Party. The early months saw the repeated burning of villages by security forces in an attempt to smoke out the guerrillas. But if anything, this only served to increase recruitment for a time. The guerrilla army expanded quickly. Many felt their only chance lay with the communists. Most were Chinese, but there were Malays too. Reinforcements arrive at Singapore from Hong Kong as Britain promises full aid in the war against the bandits because that's what it is now, war. For many recruits, this was a new experience. You weren't allowed to wash your hands. You weren't allowed to grill cream your hair. You weren't allowed to brush your teeth. You weren't allowed to smoke. You weren't allowed to eat sweets, anything like that. Um, the grillers were like animals. They could smell you a mile off. For months, the war went badly for the British. There was continued pressure to put the country under martial law but the government remained firm. We never regarded any uh, prisoners who were caught as prisoners of war. This was a very important principle. We said, you're not prisoners of war. If you have committed acts of terrorism, you're common criminals and will be imprisoned as such. Under emergency powers, thousands of suspected sympathizers were detained. Since most were Chinese and had become ineligible for citizenship under the new constitution, they could be deported to China. In round figures, something a little over 40,000 people were deported. How was that seen by Malays? I think it's true to say they were delighted. And there has always been and an undercurrent, if that's the word, between Chinese and Malays. The British priority was to control the population. They imposed an identity card system throughout Malaya to stop the communists from moving freely among the people. 
the guerrillas would hit back by confiscating the cars. They sought to paralyze the country and destroy the economy. From the start, the war was a battle for information and the guerrillas dealt with villagers who betrayed them without mercy. But there were stories too of atrocities, especially of members who betrayed the communists. They tied him up. They gouged out his eyes. They pulled out his teeth. Then they slit his tummy from top to bottom. And that was the sort of treatment that a traitor could expect. I never received a report that those who were killed by us, their body was mutilated. It was not our policy to harm the dead people, to, what, to mutilate them or to chop off their hands or heads. It was not our policy. If I can deny one or two cases happen, I say, maybe because government did those things to us. Maybe in some one place that they can't control their anger, they take revenge. I can't say that that, that would not happen. That maybe. Certainly the tactics used by both sides were brutal. When on patrol in deep jungle, security forces in the early years were permitted to cut off heads and hands of captured guerrillas for identification purposes. When this photograph of a Royal Marine commando appeared in the press, the government panicked. Official documents reveal the real reason for their concern. Such behavior is, under international law, a war crime. But since this was an emergency, not a war, there was nothing illegal in it. In 1950, after nearly two years of fighting, the situation was approaching stalemate. Both sides had lost around two and a half thousand people. Then the British came up with a plan that in the end would win them the war. In one sense, it was an obvious solution to all these people outside the control of the civil authorities and the police. Uh, the only thing to do was to bring them into protected areas where they could be policed. And uh, most of them were brought into what were called new villages. They were dawn raids, which were, of course must have been dreadful shocks. These people suddenly find her surrounded by security forces and told to get out of your house and go take her somewhere else. None of these measures was uh, pleasant, but we were out to win a, a very important guerrilla war. There were strong controls, but at first there were not enough to stop those villagers determined to supply food to the guerrillas. <laughs> Tai 
把回当回料这样挑出来咯，就想办法放在底下，上面就放一些猪大便啊、尿啊、纸水类的东西，就当回料挑出来了。Resettlement was well underway by 1951. Over a million people would eventually move. The amenities provided were way beyond most villagers' dreams. Luckily for the government, another conflict, the Korean War, was creating a massive demand for Malaya's rubber and tin. The huge costs of resettling so many people were now more than offset by the growth in Malaya's economy. After three years of fighting, Xin Peng took a decision which would profoundly alter the course of the war. The communists decided their harsh tactics were losing them popular support. The new village policy was isolating them further. So to get the people on their side, they would now concentrate on their underground organization inside the villages. British intelligence shifted accordingly. You have a terrorist in the jungle. Uh, we didn't try and get at them because their security was very, very good. I mean, you couldn't get agents into their camps and things like that. It was impossible to handle that. Therefore, their outside organisations were absolutely vital to us and to the terrorists. We often do it in a secret way. It's not a secret way to do it. It's not a secret way to do it. It's not a secret way to do it. We often do it in a secret way. We often do it in a secret way. They supplied the food, the medicine, the money, or the general requirements of the terrorists in the jungle. So they were our number one targets. Gradually, the British forced the guerrillas more and more onto the defensive. And by 1954, the new village policy was making it very difficult indeed for guerrillas to get food. By 1954, the communists decided they could not win the war militarily. To make things worse for them, they were now losing ground on the political front too. The largest Malay nationalist party, UMNO, had moved to a policy of demanding independence. Led by a Malay prince called Tunku Abdul Rahman, UMNO was Britain's preferred party of government. The British realize that while this struggle goes on, nobody is having the better of the say, the better of the fight. Uh, but in the end, perhaps they might have to give independence, so they might, have, they might as well choose the right party on whom they can trust uh, to accept independence and run the country uh, well. And that's why I think in the end, the British supported us. Through an anonymous letter, Xin Peng offered peace talks, and the Tunku readily agreed, much to the consternation of the British. Well, I think the chief concern was that um, our ministers, uh, Malayan ministers, were relatively inexperienced still. Uh, we felt perhaps they didn't really understand completely the communist objectives. And uh, the communists are clever people and we didn't quite know how they would handle a bloke like Chin Peng. I was sitting in Kuala Lumpur, uh, rather afraid of what might happen. <laughs> the eyes of the world turned for a fateful two days on Baling near the Thai frontier for talks between government representatives and communist terrorist leaders. All necks crane for a glimpse of the number one terrorist. There he is, that's him. Chin Peng, directly responsible for a brutal seven-year campaign of murder and terrorism against the ordinary people of Malaya. Behind the scenes, the British were concerned to ensure the talks 
were restricted to surrender terms only. My bottom line is that we would not accept any term that imply surrender or, or capitulation. For two days, the opposing sides talked but made no progress. I was glad I met him because as a result of my meeting with him, he made it quite clear that he's a communist, I'm anti-communist, that the two of us can never work together. On that score, we ended our talk. At the last stage uh, of the talk, uh, Tunku said, you, you, you must realize you have to accept certain form of surrender. Then I told him, if so, we would prefer to fight to, to the end. Talks ended without resolution, and Chin Peng was led back to the jungle to continue the war. So I think I was disappointed. If we didn't restore, we could achieve peace, it will mean all sides will suffer less. Less killing, death, less dying, and less hardship for the people. Over the next three years, the guerrillas were hit very hard by increasingly efficient security forces. Nearly half their number surrendered, but a dedicated hard core remained. Independence came in 1957, but still the communists fought on, and on, and on against the Malaysian and later even the Thai security forces, until in 1989, Chin Peng got what the British had denied him 34 years earlier, peace with honor. The communists, only around 1,200 by this time, laid down their arms and agreed to live in villages guarded by the Thai army in the border area they had made their stronghold for so many years. For many, the last few years have been their first ever taste of normality. But do they now think their decades-long jungle war achieved anything? <laughs> That is not a view shared by many in Malaysia or Britain. Nowadays, the jungle warfare of the emergency could not seem further away from the modern high-tech world of Kuala Lumpur. As for Chin Peng, he now leads a life of exile in Thailand, reflecting on the history that might have been. It stemmed the tide of communism. If the communists had got control of Malaya, where would it have ended? The mistake is that although we live in Malaya, we didn't understand the real situation in Malaya. Malaya is a small country, multiracial, multicultural background. So, how to unite the people? This is a very complicated problem. <laughs> <laughs>